don't think this man needs any introduction to this crowd. I'm very happy to have the air. Thank, thank you. Um, so I have a very difficult challenge ahead of me is to try to help you understand the global names architecture in 15 minutes, given that it's taken me 25 years and I barely understand it myself. I do want to thank uh, Joanna and Deb and Greg for staying on time so, so I don't have to feel too much time pressure. I want to especially thank Greg for two reasons. Uh, one, for saving me the trouble of wasting any time on my UUID sermon. I don't have to do that. And second, for calling me out as a troublemaker to all my friends, colleagues, and coworkers. All right, so to understand what the global names architecture is, it's helpful to understand why. So, so to understand why there's a need for a global names architecture, it's, you know, the first thing you have to ask is where is the world's biodiversity data? Now, obviously, we're all at an IDIG bio conference. We all know that um, uh, biodiversity data exists in natural history collections and museums, but of course, it exists in other places out there. It exists in hundreds of years of historical literature. And it exists digitally in those organizations that are digitizing that historical literature. And it exists digitally in new literature that's born every day. Thankfully, a lot of that's now born digital to begin with. But the point is the information's out there. There is a lot of biodiversity information in what we call nomenclators. These little icons over here represent the organizations that deal with scientific names of things as names, uh, not necessarily as taxa, but as names. But then there are groups of uh, data sets out there that, that deal with names as taxa, like catalog of life and worms and itis and all of those sort of things. And then there's, of course, plenty of databases um, that deal with observations of organisms in nature, eBirds and, and what have you. There's genetic data sets. There's uh, online media files of all sorts. There's uh, Google will take you to all kinds of little pockets of data all over the world. You type in any scientific name in Google, you'll find all kinds of links that are outside the scope of these obvious ones. And of course, there's this set of aggregators. Now, obviously, these, this is by no means a complete set of icons and, and logos, but uh, you kind of get the general idea that biodiversity exists everywhere. And the one thing that currently and historically link all of this information together is names, and particularly scientific names. That's the most structured way of linking information from one of these disparate data sets to another disparate data set. It's one of the greatest standards we have in biology. In fact, in all, all in science, it's a 250-year-old uh, standard established by Carl Linnaeus uh, for both plants and animals and later adopted by, by bacteria for assigning scientific names to organisms. So we can try to leverage that as much as we can. So this is a scientific name. It, it refers to the uh, bluefish. Um, and you can easily do a Google search or a whatever search in any one of these portals on that text string right there, and you'll find a bunch of records. But you probably won't find all the records. And the reason you won't find all the records is because a lot of those data sets have different flavors of how they represent that name in their data sets, slightly different spellings, sometimes with abbreviations, sometimes with authors, sometimes without authors, and with years and whatnot. So you get this whole plethora of text strings all representing the same name. And even if you've got all of that worked out. You also have uh, the fact that data exists out there um, that's linked not to the same name, but a different name that is now regarded as a synonym of the name you're interested in. So there's this taxonomic layer of complexity. So you end up with this big god-awful mess in trying to connect the dots between all these different data sets. So that's the why for the global names architecture. And just to sort of put it in bullet point form, the reason is, well, Taxon names are the fundamental link among virtually all biodiversity information. Biodiversity information relates to species concepts, but data resources are usually tied to text string names, and those aren't equivalent things. Text string names are difficult to cross-link due to all the things I just showed you, plus things like homonymy and synonymy, synonymy and all these different uh, historical problems. So linking text string names, to do it right, uh, linking these names to concepts requires a source-based or a literature-based approach to things. And the key challenge is to cross-link thousands of biodiversity data sets through taxon concepts using these text string names. So a quick history, the, the idea and the structure and the implementation of global names architecture came about through a series of what we're calling nomina meetings. As you can see, they're ongoing. Most recently, we had a two-part one in October of last year, and there were more to come. James has been a part of most of them. I've been a part of most of them. Um, and, and other key people in our, in our community have been part of them. And if you go to that website, you can learn more about each one of them and other aspects of global names. Uh, primary funding, at least the most recent primary funding, has come from National Science Foundation, two separate uh, awards. 
one for the bicycle project, which Reed will touch on in his next talk, and then uh, Global Names Architecture, which is a consortium, I mean, a collaboration between us here at Bishop Museum plus the Biodiversity Heritage Library. Uh, it was led by Patty Patterson of Woods Hole um, and also included uh, Cal Academy with uh, Stan Bloom. And then earlier than that, historical funding has come from Cyclopedia of Life, GBIF, and some of the very early funding came from the now defunct NBII, plus other little uh, sources here and there. And then these are the partners. You can read them. They've all been involved in one way or another in the development over time. And there's this group called the Global Names Architecture Advisory Panel, which is sort of the governing body, which Paul Kirk is currently the char in charge of. He's the fungal guy. So let me start by saying, when I get to the what it is, let me start by what it is not. Now, some of you know that I'm, when I'm not busy being a database nerd or a fish nerd, one of my other nerd worlds is that I design uh, deep diving equipment. And I work with an electronics engineer who's not much of a diver himself, and he has a term that he refers to often called YAD. And what YAD means is yet another damn diver. Because as a software engineer, he's sick and tired of yet another damn diver coming up to him and telling him how the system should work and why it shouldn't work this way and why it should work that way. So I've sort of co-opted that term to say what GNA is not, which is, is not yet another damn database. It's not, it is part of the alphabet soup of acronyms, but, but it's not at least intended to be just yet another damn database. So what it is, or at least what it is intended to be, has to do with what I'm going to try to illustrate here, and Greg touched on it nicely, is the difference between how we humans perceive information and, and what computers perceive. So we humans work very well with text strings like that. I mean, certainly taxonomists do, but even humans in general are much you know, better able to deal with linking that text string of characters, pomatoma saltator, lin, to this notion of a group of fishes swimming out in the ocean. Um, computers have a hard time with that. So, but what computers find very, very, very easy to work with are these kinds of things, uh, as Greg already talked about. So computers have no trouble memorizing those and linking those and using those to identify things. But because of all those problems I already mentioned, they're not so good with the text strings. So what GNA's real ultimate Uber mission is, is to build that link uh, between the human interface and the computer interface so that we can better leverage the computer strengths to answer the questions we're interested in, which is fish out in the ocean. So there's a good metaphor that I always refer to, and the technical people will, in the room will understand this, um, is there's a system out there called the domain name system. Probably a few people in this room know what it is. Probably most of you don't know that you use it every single time you're on the internet. So it's a very similar sort of thing. That's something a human can get their head around and type into a browser. But what the computer actually uses is what's called an IP address. And the domain name system is what allows those two things to work harmoniously with each other. So it allows you to type one of those things into a computer and get to a server that's identified through that number. And so I see GNA as being very analogous to this. My definition of success for DNA will be that almost everybody uses it almost every day and almost nobody knows what it is. It just works magically in the background the same way DNS does which is why you won't see any GNA logos in any of these slides. All right, so there are two, I did say it's not a data, yet another damn database, but there are database components to it. They're mostly indexes. The, one of the indexes is called the Global Names Index. Um, it's, a, it's basically optimized around these text strings, these whole raw text strings that you see out in the wild, as they say. There's 17 million of them currently indexed. Um, it includes parsing services and lexical grouping and links back to sources. So basically, this is if you go to GNI, there's a user interface. This is, just happens to be the very first ones in there. You'll see here's a name, Aaba is apparently a real genus name. Um, there's another text string with the author and year. There's another text string with the author and year and a comma between the author and year. And then there's another same genus name, but with a different author and year, and then there's species and so on. So it's literally taking the unique text string. The difference between the one with the comma and when the, without the comma, they're different things because one has a comma and one doesn't. So it's a text string. It's also got parsing services that are very, very good. It'll take that text string, break it up into the genus part, the species part, the author part, the year part. It does some clever lexical grouping, which is it says that these things are probably based simply on their text string, clustered together in some way, and it's got links back to where the sources of these text string names came from. The other data component, which is the one Rob and I have been developing, is called the Global Names Usage Bank, or GNUB. 
and it is optimized for what we call curated taxon name usages. Uh, whereas the global names index is what we call a dirty bucket, the GNUB is a clean bucket, and it's mostly focused on agents, references, taxon name usages, um, and it has some other components in there that I won't talk about, like vernacular names and other things. So I'm going to have to define these terms a little bit better. Agents is basically people or organizations. They're in there because they serve as roles, as authors of publications and authors of names. Um, I need to define references a little more precisely. A reference is any static documentation source, like a publication, a specimen determination label, field notes, correspondence, et cetera. Static is a key word there. Uh, most of what uh, these things are are publications that we think of in the traditional sense. A taxon name usage is the usage of a particular taxonomic name within a particular reference. So for example, on page 181 of this publication, there's a taxon name. And that is representative of a usage of a name in, a, in this published context. So this would be a taxon name usage row. It'd have an identifier, it wouldn't be 123, it would be a UUID. Uh, it'd be a pointer to the publication in which it occurs and what page it occurs, 181. The text string is how it was spelled and the rank it was used at, so in this case it's a genus. But this taxon name usage is a very special one, and the reason why it's special is that it happens to represent the first instance of a taxon name, of this particular taxon name, the code governed creation event for that name. So we have a term called protonym, which is very analogous to a botanical basianym, and uh, it's the particular usage of a name representing the code compliant creation. In this case, you see it right here on the page. Now, so we have an ID, and in this case, that ID is pointing back to itself, and it's saying basically, I, my record, this TNU record is the protonym for this name. We also have a link to say it's valid. In this case, this publication treated it as, as what a zoologist would call a valid taxon or what a uh, botanist would call an accepted taxon. They, treated it, they didn't treat it as a synonym, they treated it as a legitimate name. Same sort of thing. Now, if you turn the page on that same publication and go to the next page, here's another taxon name usage. And this one is a different one. It's at the rank of species. It's also a protonym because it's a new species description. And the, it's, it's treated as a valid name. And it's got an additional property, which is parent, which means that this TNU was placed in this other TNU. It's the child of that. And the reason why I make it explain all of this this way is because we treat it at the at atomic level. So the species is one row, and then the species in combination with its genus is the link between that species row and the genus row. So let's fast forward a wise uh, few decades to this publication, where a new species, selected totally at random, I promise you, um, was described in a new species, as a new species in a publication. Um, so it gets a TNU in a row. So this is Baldwin and Smith publication, its own ID over here, spelling, rank. It is a protonym. That number equals that number. It was treated as valid, and it, it's parent. Well, where does this point to? Well, this points to there. They also had a taxon name usage for the genus Balanoperca. This is not the protonym, because remember, the protonym was created back here in 1930. So what this row is for the genus has a link back to the protonym. So in this case, that is not the same as that, because this Bolanoperca, as used by Baldwin and Smith, refers to the Bolanoperca that was created by Fowler and Bean. So this is just basically how this structure works. And if you look very carefully through all this literature, you will find that there are many different taxon names. Each one of them gets its own row. Each one of them gets its own link. So I, th I, I, I know what you're probably thinking right now. This is probably not what you're thinking right now. This is what you're probably thinking right now. So um, why, why, that's great, Rich, but why, why, why is that, how's that going to help me solve my database problem? So a lot of us in the room have to deal with specimen databases. So here's a snapshot of our Bishop Museum fish collection database. Turns out we have um, one record of that name I showed up at the beginning of the slide right here. Um, it's in our database. And so here's a text string name. And we don't have much more than that. We have the text string. We know that this specimen, which was collected at these places and has this color photo, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is referable to this taxon name. And so now I'm going to walk you through what do we do with that taxon name. Well, it first goes into the global names architecture, gets parsed, as I said. It gets broken up into its bits. And then we see, well, what is the pomatomus? Let's see if we can find a protonym. Well, unfortunately, in this case, there are two pomatomus genus names out there because we have a hominin situation. 
So how do we deal with that? Each one has its own protonym. They're separate names, even though they're the same text string, but they're a homonym. Well, it turns out only one of them has ever had a species called saltator ever combined with it. So from that, we know that, oh, it's this one, because that's the, the other one never had any saltator in it. And then from that, we can get the protonym for the species saltator, because even though there may be many species named saltator, only one of them has ever been combined with the genus Pomatomus. So all of that exercise, which actually is a lot more sophisticated than what I described, will lead us to what I call the protonym of the species, which is actually described by Linnaeus and was originally called this. So we've still got a bit of a mess in terms of text, uh, of text strings, but the important thing is we went from this text string here to this globally unique identifier there. And that is the magic key. That's the key that unlocks all kinds of doors that Rob and I have been working on. So I'm going to give you just a couple of quick examples as fast as I can. We have this service called Genie, where you can take that protonym, throw it at that service, and first of all, you get everything we know about every genus combination that species has been with, every spelling variant, all of that sort of thing, and you get the protonyms for the, both the genus name and the species name. But also, you get the history of these are all of the names that have ever been treated as either a junior synonym or senior synonym of that name. So what you can do is starting with this one UUID, explode it out and do a full synonymy and do all kinds of things. First, you get this whole suite of UUIDs that you can loop back in and do the same services with, but also you can explode your text search. So if I'm looking for that text string, I can know that maybe these text strings are also relevant to what I'm searching for. So that happens fairly instantaneously. It's a way of taking a name and exploding it out into all the other names. And they're all linked to original usages. And this column here just shows you how many different publications used each one of these variants as a synonym or, or as, a, as a valid species and how they spelled it. So that's kind of cool. Uh, but that's only kind of the tip of the iceberg. So ZooBank, which is the official registry of all zoological names, um, uh, uses, is built on top of GNUB and uses the same UUID for its records. So if you wanted to know the nomenclatural history of this name, its type specimens and all of that, it's in, it's in ZooBank. And that's cool, and ZooBank has its own features, and I have a whole talk to plug ZooBank, but I'm not going to do that now. But ZooBank also uses other GNUB services that you can do. One of them is, for example, is um, this little thing over here. This is a service that automagically goes out and finds the BHL page image for the original description. And sure enough, it's almost always right, um, and you, you get to the page, and you find that, yes, sure, indeed, there's the original publication. So if you wanted to see the actual page image where the species was described, there it is. It's obviously also linked into the Global Names Index, and that's what this little link down here is for. And you can see all these different name strings used in all these different data sources for how they each treated that name. And then what I think is one of the most valuable things is this identifier cross-linking system that Greg was referring to, where you, you and, and Deb also, where you, you cross-link identifiers to each other. So all of these little icons are one mouse clicks away from each of those individual different kinds of uh, different resources for what is effectively the same name. And that same cross-linking service, by the way, is very generic, applies to everything. So the literature parts of all of this have the same sort of cross-linking service. All right, so I'm going to kind of wrap it all up here. So instead of using that text string in the middle to tie all this data together, um, we can use these UUIDs. If we can bridge the gap between the text strings and the UUIDs, we can make this happen. So. What are you thinking now? Well, probably not quite yet. We're not there yet. This is, this is probably where you're still at. It's like, well, that's sounding kind of cool, but I don't understand how I can use it. So I'm going to finish now with what I think is kind of the holy grail of what we've been after doing all this, which I call query time taxonomic translation, and another, AKA the power of meta authorities. Now, this might take a minute or so. I'm going to try to get through it as quickly as I got one minute. OK, less than one minute. Yikes. All right, well, I'm going to do this as quickly as I can. Um, this was picked at 3.30 this morning when I prepared this thing. I had no idea at the time, but it, sure enough, the author's in the room. Um, a tax on name usage is, I assert that this species epithet, saltater of Linnaeus, 1766, is spelled as such and is valid at the rank of species within this genus. And that's always going to be true. A thousand years from now, when somebody digs up this reprint, it will still say that. A meta-authority is dynamic. And the way a meta-authority works is it says, with regard to the epithet, saltater of Linnaeus, we choose to follow the treatment of page. So the meta authority could be like catalog of life. And what they're doing is punting back to a particular taxon usage that the meta authority feels got it right. So this is the magic here. This is a listing and explorer's log of all the names that were included in this particular publication here. If you look closely, though, 
and you'll see that that publication used a lot of old dirty names. So in Whitley, 1931, he used this Pomatomus Pedica, which if I'm following the Catalog of Life Meta Authority, this query will translate in real time to what Catalog of Life um, thinks it to be today. So it does this taxonomic synonymy translation, spelling correction translation, everything in real time. If 30 seconds after running this query, Catalog of Life changed their mind about what it should be, and I ran this query 30 seconds later, I'd have the new answer there too. So this applies to any data set of names. So if you have specimen data sets, leave those determinations the way they are, even if they were determined in 1908 and it's a name nobody ever uses before, because once you get it plugged into the system, you can have your queries translated to whatever your particular institution chooses to follow, be it Catalog of Life or whomever, would regard that name as being today. So that's where the real magic happens. I'll stop there and uh, entertain questions later if people have them. Thanks very much.